if any of you have read the late works of Philip K. Dick, he was probing in these areas. He was a genius. His book, Valus, is pure exegesis of his internal he unravelment of what was going on. And he believed, his take on it was, he believed that from A.D. 69 until 1948, no time had actually passed and that we were living in apostolic time and that the crucifixion lay only 75 years in the past and that the Demiurge had inserted a false history and the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, he believed, were actually the logos as printed letters and that when the when the Nag Hammadi manuscripts were deciphered it was like this informational creature would come alive and again be present on the earth that the logos beginning in 1948 was beginning to infuse everything and that shortly it would dissolve the illusion of the intervening 1860 years or whatever it was and then we would realize that the prophecy would be fulfilled and that the last days were upon us. Nailed it, Terence McKenna. Nailed it, Real Horror Show. You got Dick right. In fact, on this episode, Terence, my boy, will be talking about you too. And Robert Anton Wilson. But mostly Dick all part of an illuminative odyssey into the most powerful aspects of the early 70s esoterica. High weirdness, Terence. High weirdness. And what you'll find, Terence, my boy, is that the early 70s, as well as the late 60s, have so many parallels to today. Except it's much worse when we rip the veil open. But you knew this, right? Dick's visions and prophecies are realized, and we now live in a Philip K. Dick world. The Gnostic nightmare has come true as well. Your 2012 apocalypse didn't fail, Terrence because Yaldabaoth arrived from the 13th Aeon to fully bring down a satanic oppression upon mankind, suffocating us in a digital tornado of fraudulent realities and group thought circle jerks. Oh yes, the Gnostic nightmare came true. Here we are in 2019, worse than ever turning and turning the widening gyre. We're all the devil's children. We find what powers the sun and we make bombs of it. We achieve power and we go mad. We always destroy. Jesus, Terence. Yelled about the ride because you and your associates summoned him. And you knew that. Because you and the other gurus and rock stars and beatnik activists sold out in the end. Were compromised by the CIA and Bohemian Grove and whatnot. And betrayed all that you were meant to protect. That is human potential and human imagination. Why did you do it? Were you afraid? Did you desperately want a utopia? Needed some attention before the Archons invented social media? Why did you cast that dark magic that brought about the materialistic disco era and yuppie 80s and political correctness and goddamn ace of base and scientism? Until 2012 happened and the Demiurge completely incarnated in the world he owned. Why, Terrence? Why the fuck did you do that? If the only thing keeping a person decent is the expectation of divine reward, then brother, that person is a piece of shit. But don't be too worried, Terrence. 
Because I, Miguel Connor, and the other spiritual sons and daughters of the Gnostics are here for one last battle against the Cosmic Crater and his army of hating angels. We're preparing at Aeon Gnostic Radio at the Virtual Alexandria. You see, with the Gnostic Nightmare comes also the Gnostic Solution which includes the plasmate words of Philip K. Dick that can stop humanity from being either Soylent Green or a Westworld host. We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present, deja vu. In fact, Terence, and you true seeker warriors here with me, we have the pleasure of being joined by my favorite Philip K. Dick scholar, and just a really nice hombre, Eric Davis, to discuss his new book. Yes, High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s. Damn, Terrence, what an incredible book. And get ready for an incredible interview. You're not a member or patron at Patreon, Terrence, my boy. So you won't get the full interview and bonus, which is the audio version of the Abraxas Brief, where I discuss how this is a Philip K. Dick world and what to do about it. By the end of the full show and the bonus, we'll all be seeing those pink beams that can help us see through the hologram of Yaldi Baldi as he prepares for his final divine invasion to eradicate all sentience to hide the divine spark that fuels his nightmares. I am the architect. I created the Matrix. I've been waiting for you. I hope you enjoy it too. All of you here. And don't try going for the gates of the virtual Alexandria, Terence. Because we've got you bound by the theurgy of Hypatia. No Elohim ships will rescue you. Excuse me, I'd just like to ask a question. What does God need with a starship? In fact, please listen to a couple of quotes from Eric's incredible book. I've yammered plenty about this being a Philip K. Dick world, but here Eric makes the case, and it will blow your spiritual uterus away. Here it is. Dick's vision of Valis, in particular, reads like an uncanny prophecy of our fraught network consciousness. On the one hand, we have become thoroughly absorbed into an all-consuming, endlessly arborizing, weirdly discarnating information system. But with the onset of the Internet of Things and the spread of smartphones, sensors, GPS devices, and augmented reality, the network no longer inhabits a separate, quote, cyberspace. Instead, it is now invading, reconfiguring, and rewriting physical reality very much the way Dick describes Valis using the world of objects to organize and extend itself into our spurious reality. We find ourselves in a state of profound ambivalence, interpolated into nodes of post-human network even as we go about our ordinary lives. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a bubble universe ruled by an asshole god. As Dick writes in The Exegesis, Our little psyche world systems are perpetually bombarded with incoming information, which we process and, at the right time to the right other stations, we transmit in the rightly modified form. All this takes place through us as if we were transistors, didodes, wire condensers, and resistors all none the wiser. Meanwhile, our close private world engages our attention with challenges, 
pain and delight so that we will not merely subsist as slave components with nothing to do but function without a world we would degenerate fatally during the standby period meanwhile we have food music books and friends sound familiar more and more of a sacrifice more and more of our lives on the altar of information processing as we submit to an increasingly invasive and persuasive network that demands that we respond link like retweet and magnify our personal social networks but dick is also imagining something more subliminal here more like the way we unknowingly feed the hungry algorithms of the big data cloud farms with the invisible breadcrumbs of our digital activity here dick approaches the grim declaration of the french philosopher and pkd exegete jean baudrillard who wrote around the time of dick's death that the contemporary subject has now become quote only pure screen a witching center for all the networks of influence so much of consciousness is a burden a, a weight and we have spared them that anxiety self-loathing guilt the hosts are the ones who are free free here under my control convince terrence my boy you must know the empire never ended as you still serve yaldabaoth or saturn or jehova or allah or ariman or whatever the rex mundi calls himself depending on the culture you must know you and the others were part of his diabolical trojan horse army and you knew dick wouldn't sell out But please let me read you another passage from the marvelous high weirdness which is truly a manual to break through this virtual reality hellhole. Here Eric talks about how Gnosis works in these days in this infernal battleground we call earth. Such edgy awakenings whether we see them as quote spiritual or not are an important component to the work of emancipation which is perhaps the supreme value shared across the fissure of the counterculture motivating radical leftists hippie seekers and psychedelic anarchists alike paradoxically however the goals of emancipation and liberation were often paired at the time with sociological ideas and structural analysis that radically decenter the autonomous individual psyche attitudes motives dreams and drivers even the persona experience of reality itself were it was argued shaped or programmed by often pernicious political institutional and ideological forces so who is there to be liberated I will not make any deals with you. I've resigned. I will not be pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. My life is my own. This koan suggests the way to the sociological, cultural, and ideological analysis already lend themselves to a kind of conspiracy thinking. But to truly escape these influences and imprints, if only to turn around and reconstruct society, something more than critique is required the external struggle whether collective or anti-authoritarian needed to be paralleled with the internal work of quote raising consciousness of becoming in contemporary terms quote woke gnosis raising consciousness to peak of world rending insight becomes in this context a political gesture one that both illuminates the dark arcans that manipulate reality and provides a direct experience of that part of the self that seeks or is liberation itself awakening here is not an escape from the wheel 
but a vertiginous discernment that goes against the grain. Are you convinced, Terrence? We're not escaping, you see. We're taking your master on. We're taking his fucking kingdom away. Unlike you and the others, I would never sell out. My handler told me so. So sit tight, Terrence, and let us do the interview with Eric Davis. I say, the empire never ended. The empire is the institution, the codification of derangement. It is insane and imposes its insanity on us by violence, since its nature is a violent one. To fight the empire is to be infected by its derangement. This is a paradox. Whoever defeats a segment of the empire becomes the empire. It proliferates like a virus, imposing its form on its enemies. Thereby it becomes its enemy. Against the empire is posed the living information, the plasmate or physician, which we know as the Holy Spirit or Christ discorporate. Since the universe is actually composed of information, then it can be said that information will save us. This is the saving gnosis which the Gnostics sought. There is no other road to salvation. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we definitely have the pleasure of having back Eric Davis, this time to discuss his latest book. High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 70s. How you doing, Eric? And thanks for coming back. Truly honored. Thank you very much, man. It's great to be here. I'm doing all right. It's exciting to uh, have this book come out. And uh, you know, I feel really good about it. And uh, it, it'll, be, it'll be a blast uh, sharing it with folks. Oh, it's an excellent book. I think I read it in three days. I couldn't put it down. Again, as we were talking, right on. It's, uh, it, it's a great book uncovering the the time of these great figures. It's also relevant. It's a classic. It's just good stuff. So I'm glad to share with the audience and I will tell them don't uh, walk, but run and get Eric's book. Excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed it, man. You know, it's, I was, you know, it started out as a, as a dissertation and what I was going to do when I went to the PhD program at Rice, where you and I have, have spent some fun and times at, at conferences um, w- with their focus on esotericism and basically weird, weird religion, which is pretty rare in the study of religion, at least in the academy. And I went there and I was always just going to write a book about Phil Dick. You know, I had worked on the exegesis. I had read through tons of material. I'd read that whole book twice. You know, I mean, it's just I was soaked in it. And I was like, hey, this is perfect opportunity. Nobody will have really dealt with it. I'll, I'll you know, I, I, I you know, I, I'm first in line. I'm just going to write about the exegesis. And I really was just I had it all like charted out, like the different chapter breakdowns and everything. And there was this weird impulse that was very clear just before I began that was like, you don't want to spend the next three or four years inside of Philip K. Dick's <laughs> brain. You're going to get lost. <laughs> You'll be writing so your I was own like, exegesis. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I was like, whoa. And I kind of like, you know, pulled back. And then as soon as I did that, it was, it was instantly very clear what I wanted to do because all the time I'd been thinking about you know, these other characters and like, God, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in the early seventies. You know, you got Terrence, you got Robert Anton Wilson that I ended up really focusing on, but there's Timothy Leary and, and, you know, John Lilly and, you know, more kind of obscure new age characters. And I'm like, what, what is it? What brings them together? And I've always been interested in the seventies since college. My friends and I, we put out a zine that was devoted to the seventies. We were, there was always this thing about the seventies as a kind of misunderstood or improperly engaged with decade. And so I was like, Oh my God, I can write a, my seventies book and write about all this, these crazy characters that I love and try to at least begin to answer this question about what the heck was going on then such that there were these 
interesting resonances between them. So it was great. It was kind of a, it was a lifesaver because rather than go into the, what I like called like the matrix of rabbit holes that is the exegesis i could just sort of you know do some do some spelunking there you know i i I go deep but i i can come up and then hang out with with other kinds of uh other kinds of characters so so anyway it was a dissertation and then i was like okay i wrote my dissertation and it's like this is not a book i like good prose i like engaging prose i like jokes and there's not that many jokes into it in it but it's 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 got a lively kind of character to it. And that took a long time to do as well as kind of like writing a second book. And so I love hearing that you really enjoyed it because my, my fear is because there are some scholarly things in there, some discussions of philosophy and theory and how do we think about religion and, you know, some of these sort of more abstract questions. I worked really hard to embed them in this kind of magical flow uh, of these characters. And it sounds like, in, at least in your case, I succeeded. Yeah, if you're interested in uh, this stuff or Dick, uh, McKenna, Wilson, or just really, again, the occult, you'll like it. And I like at the end, you start getting really personal, really poignant, and you tie it in well. But I guess we should start, Eric, with the title itself. It's called High Weirdness. And the word weird is thrown about, but you yourself give it a definition. It is something that falls into the domains with an aesthetic, deviancy, and ontological. Is that what high weirdness is? Yeah, that's kind of, I mean, the phrase itself, uh, as I, you know, uh, kind of on, you know, initially, as soon as I use that phrase, I have to honor the great Reverend Stang, whose book High Weirdness by Mail was quite a revelation to me uh, when it came out or shortly after it came out in the late 1980s, part of that whole pre-internet kind of subculture trawl of weird cults and odd self-help techniques and a sort of love and amusement at the excesses of American faith and uh, uh, strange subcultures. And and it was really clear to me right off the bat, as soon as I started thinking about this, these 70s experiences, I was like, it's got to be high weirdness. And, you know, I, I just and I sat with it for a while. I was going, OK. And then I started going, well, high weirdness. What does high mean? And I wrote this whole section that I ended up cutting about high and why. You know, it's kind of an interesting idea. Like, why is it that we talk about being high on drugs? And then when you go into religions from around the world, there's all this stuff about, you know, getting high, like climbing the stairway to heaven, the ladder to up the heavens, the world tree, flying, uh, transcending, you know, there's all this up. And I was like, wow, what's that about? So I kind of thought about that for a while. And then I came to weirdness. And I was all like, what's that about? And that one really opened up. And I had already been aware that there was some kind of movement inside certain critical thinking, you know, some contemporary philosophy ideas about the weird. Uh, people were talking about weird essentialism or weird ontology. And basically, and some of there's some contemporary theorists that I talk about briefly in the book, you know, we even invoke H.P. Lovecraft, who bizarrely is one of his, you know, many forms of fandom these days is among certain kinds of philosophers known as speculative realists, who like to um, insist on the kind of that the world of objects is in some sense real. It's not just a fantasy. It's not just an illusion. But the paradox is that even though it's real and it has nothing to do with human life, doesn't care about us, doesn't want to deal with us, it's like doing its own alien thing, uh, that nonetheless, we can't ever really know it. It's not like science where we're like, oh, we're in a world of real objects and we can use instruments to map and understand and predict them. This is like, good, nice try, guys. No way. We're in we're embedded in this like immense multiplicity of non-human objects that are doing their own things that are not only obscure to us, but they're even obscure to ourselves, just the way we're obscure to ourselves. So it's this kind of weird way of thinking about the world. So I was like, oh, there's there's some weirdness going on out there. And the more I thought about the term, the more it was just the perfect way to kind of weave together these figures and, and really to weave together the the whole era or, or an aspect of the whole kind of countercultural suite uh, that goes, you know, 
well into the 80s and 90s and even today, although there's, I think things have changed in some significant ways maybe we can talk about later. But one of the things that I always like to say about the weird is that I just ask people, you know, almost don't even care about what I'm saying, just start to notice when you and other people use the term. Because it's one of those terms that is seemingly kind of a throwaway term. It's almost like a, a wastebasket term. We just, we, we put a lot of stuff there, but we don't, it, it, but it's designed for us not to really think about it. That's the whole point. It's a wastebasket. It's like, wh- where am I going to put this thing? Oh, I'll say it's weird. Then it goes <laughs> in the wastebasket. I don't have to think about it anymore. And examples of that are things that are, you know, uncomfortable, things that are a little perverted things that are disturbing, things that are kind of enchanted, but maybe you don't want to go there all the time. You know, it's a, there's a little bit of edge to it. It's it's a lot like the uncanny, except more 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 embodied and more gutter. You know, and the uncanny is kind of a sophisticated term in a lot of ways, psychoanalytic. You know, it's about dolls. It's about, you know, um, th- ways of, of, of exploring the self. But the weird is more like a place or a, a zone we go into, whether we're reading weird fiction or whether we're having weird experiences or encountering weird people. But one of the, th- the things that really I started to notice is that if you're not a believer in God or some very clear kind of divine providence or, you know, alien control over your reality or, you know, some reality tunnel in, in Wilson's terms – if you're a more or less kind of ambiguous, agnostic, uh, spe- secular sort of, skeptical sort of, whatever person, but you have extraordinary experiences. Let's say you have a, a dream that's a premonition or you have a really intense synchronicity or you know, just when you're thinking about someone, they give you like someone you haven't thought about in years, they give you a call on the phone, that kind, that kind of stuff, which happens, of course, all the time right. to all of us. You know, we all have that stuff happen. But let's say then you, you've had this thing happen and, and rather than just forget about it, which is what we mostly do, I think, you decide to talk about it. You want to tell somebody and you tell you go like, yeah, man, I was like, I hadn't thought about this person in literally in years. And there I am. I just was like, wow, I wonder what they're doing right now. And they called me. And the other person goes, wow. And then you go, yeah, <laughs> weird. Yeah, that was weird. Because we don't want to say, yes, that shows that we're actually inside of some bomy and implicate order that it transcends space and time. That's way too much. Or you don't want to say, yes, that shows that God is active in our personal lives, setting up things, telling a story that if we had the eyes to see, we could finally read. That's all too much for us, for for those of us who are in this mixed up, you know, half mythical, half scientific reality. But weird is a place that we can put all those things. And the more I thought about it, I realized it's not just a wastebasket term. Actually, if you kind of turn it upside down and you kind of like, you sort of like, pull up the wastebasket and you pour all the stuff that's in it on the table, you realize that there are some patterns there. And that's what what you were kind of referring to. One is the weird as an aesthetic, a vibe, a feeling, a a, a form of art, you know, so Lovecraft writes weird fiction. There's the idea of weird fiction, which is, has, has had quite a comeback in the last 10 years or so. Um, you know, which is kind of like fantasy that's sort of dark and not so like, a ch- you know, like a fairy tale and more like something like uncanny, sort of closer to reality, but also still peculiar. There's a sense of dread to it, a sense of, of marvels, but maybe more shadowy, you know, trickster figures, that kind of realm of the imagination is kind of weird. But then there's these other things that are more, well, they're more real. They're closer to our ordinary reality. And one, or a second one, which is really important in the 70s when we're talking about all these freaks who are living in many ways at the edges of society in their freak communities, not making any money, writing crazy books, reading crazy books, taking lots of drugs, experimenting, and and frankly, getting lost in in the sort of drift of 70s reality or 70s California in many cases, that points us to this other factor of weird, which is this idea of deviancy, 
the weirdo. You know, we first hear, I think the first place that we see the weirdo, and that's one of my favorite things about Google, the Archon Google, is that the Archon <laughs> Google chose when it was slurping, you know, the, the, the world's literature into Google Books to put this ability to search by dates. So you can you can come up with a phrase or a word you're interested in, you know, like quantum weirdness, and you go and you put it in Google Books and you go, when was the first time that somebody said that? And it's not, you know, 100% because it doesn't have everything in it, but it's pretty good for general usage. So I was like, weirdo, where does that come from? And I think the earliest I found was like the late 30s, 1940s. And then it was definitely associated with like a pervert. And it keeps that little edge of perversion, which I think is part of the spice of the term, uh, uh, but by no means its dominant meaning. But a weirdo is, a, is literally a deviant, which is, you know, another term for a pervert, but of course refers to a larger sense of deviance, which is like not following the norm, spinning off, being a freak, being a beatnik, being a drug user, being a homosexual, you know, being, uh, a, you know, a mystic or all of these ways of deviating from the norm become a site of the weird. And that's why like, you know, R. Crumb, when he decides to make a magazine in the late seventies, you know, the, the hippie era is over. It's not the hate street anymore, but there's still all, all this subculture and all these deviants that are kind of like, what do we do now? I guess we just sort of do our own thing. So he puts out weirdo magazine and weirdo magazine, this kind of collection of comics is a really great kind of spore print of the weird because it's, you know, it's not just over the top, dark fantasy, lurid kind of underground comic stuff. It's also very quotidian tales like Harvey Picar has some of his just extraordinary early strips in Weirdo. And these are very banal tales of ordinary struggles with like ordinary reality, going to the post office, working and you're like, what, what's weird about that? That's not really weird. And it's like, no, no, that's where that's where you start <laughs> yeah. to see the depth of the term is it's also just the sort of absurd, vaguely repulsive, vaguely familiar texture of everyday life. And that's when you realize the final thing, you know, I can use the fancy word ontology, but I'm really just talking about reality, is that reality is in part weird, meaning not just because it has people who write weird fiction or not even that they're because there's human deviance that other humans call weirdos, but that reality itself, this matrix that we're embedded in with its multiplicity, its, its absurdity, its beauty, its confusion, its, its uh, challenges, that that thing itself is weird. And we see it in our ordinary lives, but we also see it. And here's the kind of final thing. I was like, okay, I'm really onto something here. This weird shit is like a real thing that we've been ignoring was the use of the word weird stretching back to the 1970s in discussions of quantum physics, where not just, you know, goofy pop science writers, but physicists or analytic philosophers or in some cases, pop science writers, are like, yeah, physics is weird. Or if the world is like what quantum physics says, then it's weird. And so they start using this phrase of like quantum weirdness, sometimes quantum strangeness, to just talk about the radically counterintuitive nature of the quantum claim, which, to my mind, has to be taken absolutely seriously as a fundamental dimension of reality with a capital R. And so the fact that the weird is turned to as the place to sort of go, hey, that's right, guys. Look, we are talking about reality here. This is not some fantasy. This is not some Lovecraftian, you know, fiction. This is the real deal. But yes, it is weird. And that, that's where I went, okay, that is a key towards understanding, particularly this time, particularly 70s, but in particular really overwhelming psychedelic visionary experience, like visionary experience that doesn't fit into the conventional categories of religion or mysticism or, you know, 
oneness with nature, but instead is filled with like pop culture references and UFOs and synchronicities and paranoia and, you know, the kinds of things we see in Philip K. Dick, in Terrence McKenna, in Robert Anton Wilson, in Timothy Leary, in, in John Lilly, and a lot of people, especially in the 1970s. So it becomes kind of like a secret key to unlocking that era and the currents that are going on in these kind of nebulous realms of that era. But I think it also, and at least I hope it is also pointing to some of these larger implications of the weird that have, that involve these kind of theoretical ideas that people are doing now, uh, ways of grappling with our moment, with our moment of, of global weirding or, uh, uh, and, and, you know, again, we can talk about that later because I, I'm, I'm into talking about this, the seventies stuff. But it was a, a total gas. So, I mean, that's where we start off is this whole notion of the weird. And then we just dive into the 70s. Yeah, that says it all, Eric. And yeah, well said. And I mean, uh, the 70s was known as the me generation. But of course, what caught my eye is you quote Tom Wolfe, who said that what these figures were doing in the early 70s was a type of gnosis because they were looking inward for their divine spark. Yeah, I mean that was another, you know, t hats off to Tom Wolf. I mean, I'm Yeah. You know, amen. I mean, he's he's a weird guy, or, you know, he's dead now. But he's a weird guy and like some of his political positions and kind of the sort of statesman he became was was not exactly to my taste, but as a writer, as a journalist, as a cultural journalist, as a just an American studies guy, um my admiration for him just is unbounded and just becomes more so the more I think about some you know or, you know, encounter it. And this was an essay that I knew about, but I'd never read this. It was sort of the 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 essay that put the idea of the me generation kind of on the map. I think it was in 1976. And it turns out that Wolf was uh, an Amer he studied American studies. So he studied the cultural history of America in this broad kind of multidisciplinary way. And what's amazing about that essay is that he makes a point that, you know, actual academic scholars don't get around to for years. So he breaks the field where he says, hey, guys, all this kooky stuff that's happening in the 70s. And he's talking mostly about new religious movements and psychological cults. We could call them, you know, like Est or Synanon, you know, and things that aren't religious explicitly they're not a cult explicitly but they have some of the features of new religious movements but they're more psychological so he was kind of covering it all and he said what do we have going on here we have people seeking the real me the idea is that like if i can deprogram and that's a very 70s term program and deprogram if i can deprogram myself from the social programs that have been constructing my identity, then I'm going to uncover the real me and, and a lot of the new age. And it continues to be the case today is this sort of endless process of seeking the real me, because of course you never get there. It's like a MacGuffin in an Alfred Hitchcock movie. It's like the, right. you know, the briefcase with the weird uranium in it. It doesn't really matter what it is. It just motivates the plot. And in this case, it motivates the seeker to keep being a seeker. But Wolf recognized that at the heart of that is this heresy or, or spark. The idea that inside us is this spark of the divine. And if we can just pull off all this accreted matter and archon imprints and programming and social you know, expectations and belief structures, get right down there, bam, we get the spark and then we're free. And that's sort of the the myth, the structure. Uh, and I still think that's true for a lot of people, a lot of seekers, a lot of new age people, you know, yoga people, whatever, that if you really think about what's motivating them, it's some story like this. Like I've been improperly imprinted from the outside. I'm recovering an authentic self through these practices that strip away, blah, 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 and get to the real me. But uh, but that's where you get to this thing about the real me is a MacGuffin. Or another way of thinking of it is like maybe the self is like an onion and you keep peeling off layers of the onion until you get down there. There's nothing there. And not nothing like the Buddhist nothing, which, you know, I kind of think is maybe true. I'm sort of, you know, I kind of lean that way. 
But maybe it's just like it just breaks it all down and you're just lost, which <laughs> happened to a lot of people in the 70s. A lot of people got seriously lost because there were so many ways to go. There was no longer a center. You know, people were spinning off in all sorts of different directions, sort of subculture as we know, as as kind of a commercial opportunity for identity became you sort of exploded and there are all these different techniques and teachers and teachings and practices and paths and gurus and cults and, and, you know, all these different ways of being, uh, that, that a lot of people who were much more unified in the sixties when they, everyone thought, Oh yeah, we're going to change the world. We're, we're part of a revolution. Suddenly that doesn't happen. And everyone's like drifting, like what the, what the fuck do we do, man? (laughs) And so, you know, there's this kind of existential drift. And it's in that kind of environment with this sort of Gnostic drive that these psychedelic people, or in the case of Philip K. Dick, these sort of, you know, visionary, uniquely visionary kooks um, have uh, these extraordinary experiences that are, you know, that, you know, put to pale most people's, you know, sort of little Gnostic glimmers that they're getting through their encounter groups or, uh, you know, uh, occult practices or whatever. Uh, these guys really put the pedal to the metal. Um, but it's a great way of, of thinking about the, this, this moment. And I still think we're kind of in the, the backwash of this, this seventies heresy. I would certainly agree. In fact, it was Dick who said the problem with introspection is that it never ends. So he put it, he had his finger right on, what was going on and the the three individuals certainly had a lot of commonalities and i'm sure it must be hard to we all want would like that formula for better or worse and you detailed them eric they were all from california well only dick and raw came from working class backgrounds they all had this sort of slow damascus experience you know the serious transmission 2374 la chorrera they all toyed with being libertarian and they all had Lovecraft, the I Ching, and synchronicities as their foundation. Am I missing something? No, I think that pretty much captures it. I think in addition, you know, there's even there's one maybe I should have in, emphasized a little more. And it's kind of a weird it's kind of a weird word to use for all of them, but I think it's important to say it, which is that they're all intellectuals, meaning that they didn't just read a lot or read a, a lot of different kind of stuff. They were all very multidisciplinary and very independent thinkers, but they were thinkers. They didn't just sort of groove to all this stuff. They were putting it together. Uh, you know, there's a phrase I use, um, especially about Dick, but I think it's true of, of all of them, is that they were garage philosophers. And that, you know, gives their material a, a, such a rich dimension that that makes it very different than a lot of more spiritual or new age or seeker kind of texts from the era. Because while they all had an element of the seeker in them, Dick probably more than the other two, they also have a lot of things we associate with intellectuals, which is skepticism seeing things from different points of view, being kind of neurotic, uh, uh, being like, um, you know, kind of using ideas to sort of both disguise and outrun other ideas, this kind of pleasure in thinking itself, the pleasure in ideas and adding another idea. And how about another idea? Well, what happens if we put these two ideas together and see where that goes? I mean, they're all into that kind of game. You know, uh, when, in McKenna's case, it's very verbal. Like a lot of his intellectual production was verbal. He'd do these rap sessions, you know, all the way, you know, the, the stuff that we'd enjoy, we enjoyed as McKenna fans in the late eighties and nineties, he was already doing in the sixties. He'd smoke pot. People would come over to his house. He'd had all these crazy books and he just started riffing. You know, you call it rapping. You know, that was the term back then, you know, the, the pre rap rapping. Um, and so that was where he would synthesize all these ideas in a kind of stoner associational way that kept flowing and running. And it's a, it's a kind of intellectual production. And then, you know, Wilson and, and, and Dick are both more writer types. 
and both more, you know, more deeply philosophical, I would say, than, than McKenna. I mean, the sense that they were really familiar with a lot of religion and philosophy, uh, particularly in, in Wilson's case. I mean, he, he knew his stuff. He was a, he was a smart fella. Uh, but they, they were into that kind of mode of production. And I, that's really important for us now because I think we're in a, we're in a time and a place where all this weird stuff's going on. And it's just not the time to be a believer. It's a time to be engaged and yet skeptical and, and trying to, you know, keep, keep at least one foot on the ground, even though as you recognize that that ground itself is, is mutating and there's not much we can do about it, you know? So, uh, someone like Philip K. Dick, who on the on the one hand is kind of you know paranoid, kind of crazy, spent suffered greatly for his you know n- non neurotypical experience. Uh, no- nothing that you want to be. Nobody wants to be Philip K. Dick. He had a ru- you know he had a rough fucking ride. But what does he do in the midst of that? He keeps thinking. He keeps inquiring. He keeps asking questions. You know, and maybe. Old, maybe to, to an unhealthy degree, you know, he couldn't settle down and just go, whatever, I'm a Christian, fuck it. <laughs> I'm just going to go to church. <laughs> stop worrying about it. You know, sometimes you want him to do that. You're like, dude, stop, give yourself a break, man. Be a Zoroastrian for a while. Just just chill out, <laughs> you know, worship the fire. And he just, he keeps going and going and going like this, like, you know, ever ready bunny kind of style. Uh, but Th- that to me is very inspiring that the movement of thought of criticism of skepticism of playfulness of speculation in the midst of these very weird experiences uh i find really fascinating and that was a lot of what i was trying to articulate is how do these guys do this how are they bringing things together how are they thinking um what can we learn from it and uh yeah so that was really that was another thing that really brought them all together Yes, and I think you also write that they were influenced, well, at least McKenna and Raw by uh, uh, Crowley's empiricism, and but all three were influenced by Carl Jung. So they were they were again empiricists. They wanted to record their own voyages, their ro- own insanity. It's like they were studying their own minds the whole time. They could sort of step back once in a while and not take themselves too seriously. Yes, exactly. That's a really good point. That whole in the and in the the book, what I try to do is sort of explain that 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 empiricism um, a lot through William James and the idea of kind of, you know, there's sort of coupled ideas. There's empiricism, pragmatism. And one thing that I think those things lean lead towards is something like pluralism. You know, William James, his last big book was the pluralistic universe. I mean, he basically was talking about a pluriverse or as we would say now a multiverse, though he didn't mean it in the way that physics means it with like literal multiple dimensions. He meant that reality itself, when you boil it down or when you're honest about what you actually know about reality, you have to say right off the bat that it looks plural. It doesn't look like it's one thing or is driven by one thing. And this is something that people in the West just can't deal with because they're either scientists and you think, oh, you boil it all down, it's like laws of physics. That's the one thing. Everything else is kind of like froth. Or you leave that reality and you go into religion or the new age and then it's just some other thing. Oh, we're all one. Or, you know, it's a, it's a great divine trap. Or it's meaningless. It's just an empty grinding absurdity or whatever. And yet the way I've come to think about things uh, is that we're in a situation that is fundamentally pluralistic. And I think that explains partly why these guys can never really make up their minds. They're jumping around from different perspectives all the time. And, you know, with Robert Anton Wilson, he's talking about reality tunnels he keeps shifting. He talks about how we have multiple people within us. There's the lover, the shaman, the poet, the worker, the father, the skeptic, and how we need to keep those, all of those figures, you know, healthy and interacting or dick with his kind of almost multiple personalities or his constant changing of worldviews. And, you know, McKenna is a little bit different on, in that, but, you know, the, the different ways that he, uh, you know, his humor about the situation he was in, his willingness to like 
rove and nomadically move between all sorts of points of references and different phases in history, different ways of understanding science and the occult and metaphysics, science fiction, literary production. To me, they're, they're all trying to grapple with something, which is that what you, what you see in vision is not one thing. And the fact that it's not one thing is hard because our template is, is sort of like you come back from the mountain, you saw God, and then you got like, you know, 10, 10 rules. That's it. You know, or you see God, you have, I'm God, you know, I've, I've gotten the, the download. Now I know X. I know the end of the world. The date's going to be this or whatever it is. There's some kind of revelation that has a, a singular character. And whether these guys were infected with postmodernism, whether the world's changed or whether it's always been this way, I feel like what they confronted is the radical multiplicity of reality. And it's like, what do I do with that? I got to like, pull out all the stops to try to tell some story that's going to let me navigate through that, you know, kind of, you know, multidimensional hive labyrinth. Uh, and I think they all try to do that. They all fail. They all shed light. They all, you know, kind of both inspire us and lure us into traps along the way. Uh, that's at least how I experienced it, right? Writing about them and, and thinking about them, you know, for a lot, for a long time. I had to laugh a few times because, for example, talking about the legacy today, obviously we can say McKenna, you know, Silicon Valley with their obsession with DMT and technology and new age kindness and all that. But you have a section on Operation Mindfuck and uh, you write about it's basically like today's shitposting and trolling. I think you write... You can turn paranoia into a form of insight and even enjoyment, a kind of Gnostic Jewish science that subverts the heaviness of conspiritual conviction through the interplay of uncertainty. And then you really start writing about how Dick used to do this uh, shucking and jiving, or just bullshitting. Even Gary Lockman talks about it in his book, Dark Star. And I was like, oh my God, these people were, they were setting, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, trolls, shit posters today, these guys were doing it. And they really, they're, they're the pioneers of this sort of stick it in your eye society. Yeah, it's, it's really true. And I'm still struggling with how to think about that. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I definitely wanted that to be part of the story, although I don't do an extensive, you know, discussion of the contemporary moment to really really uh unpack it all you know it's it's also true of the subgenius you know you can go back and you say yeah you know from the from the 60s on with uh, the the emer uh, you know emergence of discordianism and then with robert anton wilson with the illuminatus and then sort of with you know a lot of uh, of of dick stuff and dick's whole kind of way of talking of kind of you know, and you can see it in his letters, you know, that I, I really encourage anyone who's a, who's a Dick fan to to read the letters. I mean, you really learn a lot about the guy, not not all of it pleasant. Uh, but one of the things you learn, and it's something I do a little bit, one of my favorite parts of the Dick section is I, I found that he had he had. Uh, he had tell he had told a similar story a number of times in these different letters over a relatively short period of time. And it kept changing. And sometimes it was super mystical. Sometimes it was just kind of funny. And sometimes it was pretty ordinary. And after a while, it became pretty clear to me, like, what the quote unquote real thing probably was. I mean, you don't, ne you don't ever know. And I, I could see him kind of reconstructing it, you know, using his plot brain. You know, he had this amazing plot brain that was constantly just coming up with, with scenarios, with plots. And like a lot of the exegesis, especially a lot that was left on the cutting room floor for the last, you know, big edition, um, a lot of it is just plots that are either or both kind of like bad plots for books that he shouldn't have written and didn't write or paranoid speculative scenarios like, oh, the Russians had this thing and they're talking to the satellites and then there's this dimensional hole and whatever it is, just on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> so he had this mind that could come up with stories and he'd have different interlocutors, different readers. And so he'd sort of try stuff out in different ones for different purposes. And in that sense, he's a classic bullshitter, which, you know, Harry Frankfurt distinguishes 
from a liar, like a liar is consciously veiling something in order to achieve a particular effect, whereas the bullshitter is kind of just <laughs> just kind of enjoying and using. It's like more like an art. Uh, it's like this weird art of like taking up space and and sort of well shucking and jiving is the is the phrase that that, that Dick talked about. Um, you know, and in in certain contexts, that's really fun or it's innocuous, maybe a little annoying, but it contains within it the nihilism and the strategic weaponizing of nonsense or of bullshit that defines a lot of of contemporary trolling and you know meme magic alt right stuff but not just alt right stuff just also the whole culture of of trolling and shit posting and so it's like there's some really clear ties and that's just the dick thing and then you go to discordianism and making pranks and playing with conspiracies, luring people into belief structures by acting like you are that thing. So like writing material that seems to suggest that, that the, uh, the Illuminati is real, but then using it to try to lure people who are soft-headed enough to think that the, it, the Illuminati might really be real just that way. And then you start fucking with them. Or, and then you go beyond bullshitting. And you're doing, you're doing what I also talk about in the book. And I, I, have a, I also really like this section Mind fucking, the whole idea of mind fucking. Is mind fucking something we want? Is it something we don't want? Do we enjoy it? Do we not enjoy it? And one of the things about this time in the 60s with these guys um, is that mind fucking was kind of fun. It's like you'd, you'd read some crazy book and you go, wow, man, that was a mind fuck. You know, Eric Von Donick, <laughs> and, yeah, there were astronauts back in the, whoa, that was mind fuck, you know, or whatever. And, and but then there were the other kind of mind fuckers, like the creepy, culty folks who, you know, are kind of, you know, trying to control people. And, and you know, Manson, whatever example, is like a mind fucker. There's an early 70s journalist book that goes around and looks at cult leaders called Mind Fuckers. And, you know, so there's some really heavy uh, moral issues there. And what you have with, with the Discordians, with Robert Anton Wilson, with the subgenius – is people who were still on the, the light side, more or less, of mind fucking. They like to fuck around and play with reality, play with belief structures. And it is this kind of jouissance, meaning it's pleasurable, but there's something a little creepy or weird or a little bit like, eh, not so, you know, not so healthy, maybe, about this stuff, you know, about bullshitting. If there's something a little unseemly about it. Uh, but at the same time, it can be really, really fun. And if you're not, if you don't get stuck in the, if you don't not get the joke, it's, it's pretty entertaining. And yet all of the tactics, all of the vibe is just, just a notch away from a certain kind of nihilism. And then what, what's happened now is that whole mode has been, uh, has been weaponized, like meaning that it's been brought to a kind of instrumental, strategic, tactical, uh, uh, expression that is almost designed to not just be enjoyable or weird or tricksterish on its own, but to actually change the whole environment to sort of um, undermine the conventional forms of trust and communication that st have structured consensus reality. Uh, the way that like a little bit of disinf you know, it's like an old intelligence game, a little bit of disinformation in the stew makes everything questionable. So then, well, maybe it's all disinformation. So you can tactically add little bits of bullshit or nonsense and they go and they kind of infect the stability or believability of a whole zone. And now that whole process has been re refined and intensified by the dynamics of the Internet and, and how belief is operating and how news gets distributed. So we're in a very different era, but I'm afraid that there is a direct line between that stuff and the pranks of the subgenii or the discordians. Yeah. And of course, as you write, definitely the whole meme magic, the mind virus, all that Dick was already predicting, employing and all that. And so the next question too was, uh, wanted to ask you, Eric, that, uh, when I get really into Dick, because again, uh, obviously he's my favorite of the three, 
But uh, one of the things that happens often is uh, I get into arguments with people on the Internet. They tell me, well, you know, Dick was eclectic and all this good stuff. And he, he played with a lot. And I tell him, well, the 2374 experience was a Gnostic experience. I mean, that you can say, and it defined him. It was a turning point, And uh, it really left a huge legacy. But as you write in your book, High Weirdness, Dick actually really had a his first Gnostic experience in 1963 when he saw that face in the sky. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you know, the thing about Dick is like it, you you can't just look at two three seventy four. You have to go look. This guy was having weird experiences, you know, at least back through high school. You know, one of the things I found in uh, the Greg Rickman bio was this description of a time when like space and time sort of melted away and he's having some kind of fit, you know, it's totally unpleasant. There's nothing mystical about it except the way that he kind of narrates it. At least later on, you can tell that he's, he sees it as having some kind of philosophical or ontological implication, but it's still just like a profoundly uncomfortable, strange, non-ordinary state that's sort of produced by his, let's just say, non-neurotypical uh, being. You know, I mean, I don't want to um, diagnose Dick. That's a whole trap that in a way he he undermines from the get-go precisely by his incredibly sophisticated knowledge of psychiatric diagnoses and, and drugs. It's like he's, it's very tricky to try to diagnose him. But one thing you can say is he's not neurotypical he was having altered states all the way through. And later on, they take on a particularly religious dimension. I mean, I think the, the face in the sky vision in the early 60s when he's, you know, just sort of just after Man on the High Castle. It's around the time he starts writing Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. It, it probably inspired the figure of Palmer Eldritch. Uh, may have been around the time of Kennedy assassination. We don't know exactly and we also don't know whether that inspired his turn towards the Episcopalian church or whether it was in tandem. You know, my gut feeling is that it, it, it mostly inspired it. But, you know, again, we don't really know the super details. But we do know that he had this sort of vision. And the thing about Dick, too, is you have to, like, I think the, probably the, the idea about rel religious experience or extraordinary experience that's the most important that I bring forward in terms of thinking about Dick is that you have to recognize it's kind of a loop. You can't just say there's the experience itself and then there's what you say about it later. It, it's more complicated than that. It's a loop because the way the experience is quote unquote in itself is already an effect of writing or ideas or concepts or symbols. So you never really have an experience in itself, but that doesn't mean you don't have an experience. Like some people say, oh, well, you're all just, you're just making it up. You're just telling a story based on what you've already read. He didn't really have anything happen. Or if he did, it was just like a weird little hiccup in the brain. And then he told a whole story about it. No, 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 no. It's, it's weirder than that. You actually have this extraordinary experience, but the experience is kind of like a text in that. It's, it's using words that have come from the past that you didn't make up. It has it echoes in symbolic ways that maybe you're not in control of. It has multiple meanings in ways that you're not in control of. The way that we would say a poem has multiple meanings that you can analyze it and maybe the author didn't mean it. It's like experiences, especially visionary experiences, are like that too. So that vision in the early 60s is great because he was almost certainly – well, no, he was certainly taking speed and probably too much speed. And it could have just been an amphetamine psych psychosis. I mean, amphetamine can, excess of amphetamine can produce visionary experiences, hallucinogenic experiences, paranoia, but, you know, full on visions. And so, you know, that might have been it too. And later on, when he tells that story, he kind of deconstructs it in certain ways. He sort of refers to psychology, he kind of makes it weird reference to drugs, but not to amphetamines, but you kind of think, ah, oh, he's talking about amphetamines. But then later he'll come back and sort of see, I saw the reality of evil. So he had these multiple layers within which he embedded his experiences. So they didn't just mean one thing or mean, 
even a religious thing. They could also be interpreted psychologically or merely psychologically. And he would kind of do both. Um, but I think this vision of a, which is so Gnostic because it's that there's a God, but it's an evil God and it sort of controls everything or at the very least it's in the sky. It's not meaning like right. it's in the place that the, that we normally think of the good God lives, but instead it's, he's made of metal. It's this sort of Android human problem. That's such an important theoretical post human to topos for, for Dick, you know, and he's got these sort of elements and you know, my friend Marcus Boone even thinks like the, the iron jaws is almost like the the speed freaks clenched jaw, you know, which I think is uh, kind of a yeah. kind of an interesting echo that I that I like to at least bring up. It it adds something to it. And then, of course, this experience is tightly coupled, however the causality runs, to his conversion to Episcopalianism. And, you know, it's incredibly important that Dick would just declare himself a, a, a Episcopalian and a Christian most of the times that he was asked. He never stopped saying he was Episcopalian. I mean, sometimes he'd go, I'm a Gnostic or whatever. He'd say other stuff too. But, you know, his turn towards Christianity was was serious. I mean, he was, in some sense, a Christian writer, you know, a Christian thinker, a Christian writer, just not your mom and dad's Christian. But he, But to say he wasn't a Christian, oh, he was actually a Gnostic or he was actually a freak or actually eclectic or whatever you're like yeah that's all true but but we do him a disservice and i think you do history a disservice to to not let his self-description as a christian and an episcopalian you know determine it so then he becomes episcopalian then he writes three stigmata of palmer eldritch which in classic phil dick way could be read as a, an absolutely profane if not satanic satire of the central yeah, yeah. <laughs> feature of the Christian right of communion. And like, how, what is going on? What is going on in his head? Is he like, does he have to like express the, the dark side and the fiction so that he's able to really believe or is it always mixed up? I mean, he's, you know, he's just endlessly enigmatic in, in, in these ways. But, but for me, that whole moment in the early 60s, that's, it sets in motion. A lot of things that are then going to culminate in two, three, seventy-four. There's other experiences. There's drug trips. You know, there's early acid experiences where he hears Latin. Oh, Latin! You know, like Christian hymn. You know, he's. It's already there. Rome <laughs> is already in the picture in some of his earliest. Yeah, you talk about he, he had a he did an acid trip and then he was transported to Rome to face this angry god. So. Before two three seventy four, this was already being set up. Yeah, and that and that's the thing about two three seventy four is that I I think we have to have like we have to think of it pluralistically. It something happened, something cognitively, spiritually, ontologically, temporally, whatever within Dick's reality stream, something happened. And yet, when you look at that something, you see with finer and finer detail the way it was set up, the way that he wrote himself into it, just the way that, you know, Tagomi's encounter with the, 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 the jewelry in, uh, in where, where is he? He's like, he's like in San Francisco, he's like in, in right by the Embarcadero, you know, he's sitting there on the bench. He stares at this little jewel. He talks about the light glimmering off the thing. And you're like, Whoa, that's, that's a lot like the, the fish necklace. And so 2374 sort of brings together all these threads, some of which you can trace very directly to things that have already been written, and then does something with it that is still extraordinary, still transformative, still, uh, you know, creates an, an opening for God knows what. And, and that loop, I think, is really insightful about what it is to have extraordinary experience or what it is to have religious or mystical experience like we'd like to think that no oh, now we've seen through the veil and we saw reality as it is on our dmt trip or in some deep meditative grok or whatever and while those things are all very real as extraordinary experiences they relate to the weave and a different you know they're they're maybe a little bit more obscure than we want them to be or at least some of us want them to be 
But in a, another sense, that's kind of the beauty of it is we're always in this collective story that has these moments of punctuated intensity, which kind of scramble the codes and allow new things to happen, new, th new things to be perceived. But the more we look at them, the more they don't really have the status of, of some kind of metaphysical claim because we can't see, we still seeing through a glass darkly. It's just that the glass has suddenly become brilliantly lit, uh, but it's still glass. And uh, uh, so it's for me, it's like really like the, the richness of Dick's oeuvre, the richness of the exegesis of the corpus of letters of the essays where he's referring to this. I mean, it's an extraordinary collection of materials around an extraordinary experience. And while he was a very singular person, unique fellow, you can't really compare anyone to him. So in that sense, you can't just say, oh, it's like Dick experience. But at the same time, <laughs> it's just such a wonderful way to, to, to probe these, these issues, which for me became more interesting than the fiction. Not like I'm not totally, I mean, I'm completely you know, I'm marked by the fiction. I imbibed it so deeply and it's such a important part of my life that I feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I, I've never gotten out of the three stigmata universe for better or worse. Well, probably actually for worse, but, uh, but in, in another way, I also increasingly look at Dick as much as a, an American mystic or an American seer as an American author. Uh, and it's an interesting angle on him. You're right, Eric. All we can do with these mystic experiences is we're interpreting. I think you use the analogy when we have this really vivid dream and it's so full of emotion and prophecy. As soon as we wake up, all we're going to do is interpret that dream. It's sort of gone. That's the best we can do. And all mystical experiences are interpretations. But you write in your book that with McKenna and Wilson, you just basically retold their visions very straightforward. This is what happened happened. With Dick, you basically had to take a different approach, right? Yeah. You had to interpret the interpreter or try to figure out Dick's interpretation, his sort of, again, labyrinth of yeah, interpretation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think that, that some degree of that is true for, for all of these guys. In fact, it's certainly true. But it's just that it's more most interesting to do that with Dick. So rather than constantly, I mean, like if I was a more careful scholar, I would always say, I would never say, oh, they experienced this. I would say, oh, in their account of their experience or in the text that they produced after the experience, they said this. And I just gets kind of tedious. And I'm so I'm like, look, let's just let's just go with the story. And there's certainly enough uh, similarity in the accounts of Dennis and Terrence. And then over time, there's a consistency in the accounts that I think that we can you know, be roughly confident that they more or less had some of these experiences the way they talk about. I don't think uh, Terrence was making it up that he saw a UFO. I think he had the experience of seeing a UFO. So you can just talk about it. Um, but then coming to Dick, I, I could you ha can't just do that. You have to acknowledge the the looping character um, of the whole thing. You but know, I, been... I always enjoy talking to me, Miguel. You're one, you're 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 my favorite Gnostic. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And you're my favorite Dick scholar or Dick uh, devotee or just a uh, guy who didn't fall into Dick's labyrinth, but is still trying to understand him. <laughs> right on. Yeah, Eric, thanks just so much for coming on Aeon Byte. And again, I really loved your book, High Weirdness. And I definitely suggest the audience to get it because it even, again, there's a lot of answers and inspiration how to get out of these uh, strange times. But uh, thanks for everything and good luck with the book, Eric. All right. Thanks a lot, man. It's been great talking to you. And there you have it, my beloved True Seekers and Terrence McKenna. The first part of our interview with Eric Davis on his book, High Weirdness. Don't walk, but run to buy it, I suggest, if you want to understand the strangeness in the 70s that is just the same today. In our second part, Eric relates how Dick's experiences are actually unique from the other lords of high weirdness and all in modern esoteric thinking, really. He talks about how the Gnostic ancient text, the Hymn of the Pearl, greatly influenced Dick. We get granular and break down many of Dick's more impactful novels. 
In the end, we contemplate if Dick found peace towards the end of his life, and perhaps even transcendence. Then we pivot to modern day conspiracy theories and conspiracy culture, and how the ideas of Dick and Robert Anton Wilson influence both. We certainly focus more on Wilson. Although Eric told me before the interview that he wanted to avoid both modern day conspiracy theories and culture because all other podcasters want to talk about it, it certainly happened and we gave some attention to MK Ultra. And then Eric got passionate and admits he went on a rant, blasting both right wing and left wing conspiracy culture and their theories. It was intense. And don't miss it. And as mentioned in the intro, for members and patrons, you'll also get the audio version of the Abraxas Brief, where I talk about how we live in a Philip K. Dick world and what to do about it. It's two and a half hours of pink beam gnosis to get ready to go to war against Yaldi Baldi and his invasion of 2012. So please become a member of Patreon for the full Valis enchilada. Except for you, Terrence, as we need to figure out how to redeem your ghost. I hope you're enjoying your stay at the virtual Alexandria and this red pill cafeteria. For the rest, oh you wonderful paladins of Sophia, please go to the God Above God Dad Cam for means to support and gain full shows and so many other rewards, including an invitation to my new Discord channel. We're going to war with the Demiurge, and we've already won if we simply embrace introspection, reason, and the power of imagination. Isn't that right, Terrence, my boy? Hello and goodbye as always.